Kenyans are waiting to find out who their next president will be in one of the tightest and most competitive election races in the country's history. Who will succeed President Uhuru Kenyatta and will the losing side accept the result? VOA's Vincent McCory is in Nairobi for us with the latest. We'll hear from voters, look at the voting process and the money spent on the campaigns. We'll also look at the challenges that lie ahead for the incoming president. Also, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken launches a new U.S. strategy for sub-Saharan Africa during a three-nation tour of the region. What is in the plan and what is behind it? We'll bring you in-depth reporting and analysis. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and welcome. I'm Heidi Adams. It's so great to have you with me. All eyes are on the East African nation of Kenya after tens of millions of voters cast their ballots in crucial elections on Tuesday. Now Kenyans are waiting to hear who will lead their country for the next five years as President Uhuru Kenyatta reaches the end of his term and prepares to hand over power. Now the leading candidates, Deputy President William Ruto, who casts himself as a political outsider despite serving two terms as the country's deputy leader and Kenya's former Prime Minister Raila Odinga. He has the backing of his one-time adversary and current president Uhuru Kenyatta. This is his fifth try at the highest office in the land. Now Kenya's electoral commission has up to seven days to declare a winner. No outright winner means a runoff election within 30 days. For an outright victory, a candidate must secure more than half of the overall votes, plus a minimum of 25% of the votes in more than half of the country's 47 counties. Both Odinga and Ruto are vowing to accept the outcome of the vote. Kenyans have also elected a new parliament and local administrations. And for the latest on that election, let's go now to Vincent McCory. He's the TV managing editor for VOA's English to Africa news service, and he joins us from the Kenyan capital of Nairobi. Vincent, so great to see you. Tell us, are there any early signs that give us any idea of which way this race is going? Well, in a few words, you can say it's too close to call. The uh, numbers have been coming in, but um, from every indication, no one can outrightly claim that they have taken any significant lead. In fact, the, there have been kind of a changing of, uh, throughout the day and throughout last night. At one moment, uh, uh, Mr. William Ruto is ahead, and at another time, uh, uh, Mr. Raila Odinga is ahead by a few points. So as they continue counting, uh, we will keep watching. But at the moment, you cannot say that there's any clear indication that one of them is taking any significant lead, uh, other than the fact that uh, people have to keep waiting patiently. A huge part, Vincent, of any election is, of course, turnout. What was turnout like during this election? I know there was concern about whether there would be voter apathy. Were those concerns valid? They were more than valid. Initially, there were expectations that a number of people, especially the youth, would not turn up to vote. In fact, many of those that we spoke to, especially uh, the, in their 20s and perhaps 30s, had expressed disenchantment with the politics of this country and uh, dis had said they are clearly uh, not going to participate in the program, in the electoral process. But then, uh, eventually, when the election took place, on Tuesday, it was actually so surprising that the turnout was so low, even in, to, in some of the strongholds of the front runners of this uh, election. So it is uh, so disturbing, and people are trying to understand what really happened. What is it that they didn't say before? The voter apathy seems to have been way more than had been anticipated. And so as uh, the, the numbers start coming in and people start as analyzing, uh, that is the big conversation now in every corner of this country, why the low turnout. It was extremely low. 
Uh, and, and to that point, Vincent, Kenya remains one of the strongest democracies, if not the strongest in East Africa elections. They're, of course, always widely and closely watched. But another big concern is that we could again see post-election violence like we did in previous cycles. Both candidates have said they will accept the results. But will their supporters? Well, you know, the... And the supporters listen to the leadership. Uh, there might be a protest here or there, but it doesn't seem like there is a, uh, the kind of atmosphere uh, that would lead to uh, real violence like what we watched, uh, we witnessed in 2007. And, and in fact, the candidates, both sides have said they will accept the results. From all indications, the IBC seems to be doing an okay job in terms of uh, submitting the results and also how they conducted the election. Nobody has at this point really accused the Electoral Commission of having uh, done any kind of a fishy thing with, with the process. It looks like it is generally acceptable. There's criticism of, uh, uh, you know, how they, they organized it. There was some disorganizations in places, delays, but nobody has outrightly accused the Electoral Commission of uh, probably uh, playing around with this process in, with the intention of cheating any of the candidates. In fact, um, the, the, the general consensus is that uh, there are there is no, there are no shenanigans in the process itself. But then again, as we always say, in, when the final number is announced, when they finally announce who has won and who has lost, is when we'll know for sure whether there will be, uh, you know, any form of protest or demonstrations. What I can say briefly is that the circumstances of 2007 were extremely different than what we are witnessing today. And even to some degree, 2017 uh, cannot compare to what we have witnessed today in terms of the conduct of the election itself and the reaction to the submission and the release of the results as we speak. Well, some of the issues that Kenyans are grappling with appear to still be the same. And it was Raila Odinga who said Kenyans have four big enemies. He reportedly said diseases, stupidity, poverty and corruption. Now, from your conversations with voters, what are the main issues that drove them to the polls this time? Uh, did they go for the candidates or for their agenda? It's very difficult sometimes to tell in this country whether people are voting for the agenda or the personality. You, if you look at the manifestos of all the presidential candidates, they address the same issues, you know, corruption, education, health care, economy, unemployment. They all promise the same things. And to some degree, that can be attributed to uh, the uh, low turnout, or rather low turnout can be attributed to that because the voters are saying we hear the same promises from all the politicians all the time but as soon as they get into power none of them seems to perform none of them seems to resolve those issues so in terms of the issues on the table they all laid out the same issues and they all had some really impressive plans manifestos but do the citizens have faith that they would actually uh, fulfill those promises. That is where the problem is, and that is why we see that voter apathy. And indeed, for those who went to vote, uh, well, they did it for several reasons. First, they believe it's a civic duty to do so, but others also just to have faith. They want to hope that perhaps, perhaps this time around it will be different. And uh, of course, we know that uh, the reaction many times is of disappointment a few years into everybody's uh, first term in office. Now, Raila Odinga and William Ruto, of course, not the only um, candidates who are running for the highest office in the land. But at this stage, Vincent, it does appear to be a two-horse race between Raila Odinga and, and William Ruto. Is it likely to stay that way until we hear the official results? Oh, yes. I, I mean, uh, Professor uh, Wajakoya, George Wajakoya, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, the Reverend uh, uh, David uh, Maure are getting uh, some votes uh, from different parts of the country, you know. They're, they're, they're definitely going to get a little percentage uh, of the votes that have been cast. But the reality is that this is about the two front runners. I mean, the distance between Wajakoya uh, and the, the other two is just so big that there won't there will be 
a miracle if there would be anything that can, can, can actually bridge that gap. So at the moment as we speak, the focus is on Raila Odinga and William Ruto. Uh, Vincent, how soon until we know official results, until we know who the next president of Kenya will be? I just came from the tallying center, the national tallying center, where the electoral commission chairman, uh, Wafula Chibukati, was giving an update. And he said they have up to seven days to announce the elections. But they're working hard and they want to do their best to announce these results as soon as possible. Now, he didn't say exactly when, but he said as soon as possible. They have no intention of stretching it all the way to seven days. That's what he said. So we are expecting and hoping that perhaps maybe tomorrow, uh, perhaps on Friday, we might get um, some kind of idea of who is the president of this country in the next five years, for the next five years. Well, we wait with great anticipation and with bated breath. Vincent McCrory, thank you so much for your time. Vincent is the managing editor for VOA's English news service in the TV section. 20 million Kenyans were registered to vote in this election. We asked some of them why it was so important that they come out to vote. We are going to have a very peaceful election, we are going to have a very fair election, and we are going to have the right person, public choice. And whoever comes in, uh, he or she is, is going to be the best person for Kenya, for sure. The county that I'm coming from, from I'm coming from Kisi, you can see like most of the MPs have been there like for ages. But uh, I'm just glad that uh, during this one now, you can see people who are uh, 21, 22, 20 something, who are vying to get a position in their government. So I'm just happy, but uh, at least we are changing things from the way they were. I want some changes. And if I don't vote, those changes won't happen. Because if I say that I won't vote, maybe someone else also is saying that there's no need of voting. So I just, I just saw it was like, uh, it is my responsibility to come and vote so that those things that I want to be represented, uh, they can happen. Okay, the experience of voting today was so well organized. And uh, we appreciate the IBC, the, the way they are operating their their electoral process. I think it was nice. The reason I chose to vote was because I wanted to be proactive in the leadership of the country. Yes, it's discouraging sometimes as young people because most of the leadership positions go mostly to the elderly. Yeah, though this time we are proactive and we are hopeful that this time the leadership we get are for us and have our interests at heart, yes. <laughs> it's very key because one, it's uh, constitutional right. At every five years, we have to give new leadership a fresh mandate. And uh, more importantly, it gives us an opportunity to assess who, which leadership we require in terms of those who've been there, what kind of performance they have delivered, and those who are coming in what kind of uh, promises do they have for us? And we trust that they are up to the task. Kenyans, they're telling us why they cast their ballots in Tuesday's election. Now, for many voters, the high cost of living, joblessness and corruption were top of mind as they cast their ballots on Tuesday. The new president will have to face the deep economic troubles and massive rich-poor gap of East Africa's largest economy. But this election has also shone a spotlight on the high cost of election campaigns. After heavy spending and lavish displays of wealth by some of the candidates and their parties, it's raised concerns about the impact on Kenya's democratic development. Juma Majanga reports from Nairobi. In the air, on the ground, the lavish display of wealth in Kenya's August 9 elections is almost unmatched, say experts. Kenyan elections are among the most expensive in the world in terms of the cost per vote by the uh, electoral management body our, our IEBC, but also in terms of on-the-ground financing. It will cost you uh, a bit more than uh, 4 billion uh, Kenyan shillings just to become a president. 4 billion shillings is about 33.5 million US dollars, 
a race for governor runs about $336,000 and a bid for parliament roughly $168,000 according to Transparency International in Kenya. Critics say the high cost of running for political office in Kenya has disenfranchised special groups like women, the young and persons living with disabilities. Beth Nguni is running for parliament in Kirinyaga County, her fourth attempt as an independent. She says it is too costly to run as a candidate for a political party because of the high nomination fee required. The higher the seat, the higher the money they demand. And you've got to give them. Because if you don't give them, they won't even allow you to address the gatherings. Political campaigns around the world are inherently expensive. But observers say in Kenya, campaigns are largely unchecked and unregulated. Because many people live below the poverty line, observers say voters are more susceptible to bribery by wealthy politicians, fueling a cycle of government corruption. Because of this unregulated spending, uh, those in power always look towards corruption as a reliable source of money for their campaigns because they cannot afford to use their money. That would be too risky. What if they failed? The Kenyan 2010 constitution requires the country's electoral body, the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, to develop campaign financing and spending regulations. All attempts by the commission have been rejected by parliament. Unless checks and balances are put in place, observers say politics in Kenya will largely remain a preserve of the rich. Juma Majanga for VOA News, Nairobi. Well now for a look back at the campaigns, the election process and a look ahead at what awaits Kenya's next president, I'm joined via Skype by Ken Kishinga. He's a senior economist with Mentoria Economics. He is in Nairobi. Also with us is David Monda. He's a professor of political science at City University of New York and he joins us via Skype as well from that city. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you for having me. Uh, Ken, I'm going to start with you here. What is your assessment of how this election has gone so far? And here I'm talking about the voting process itself and now with the counting underway. Uh, many thanks, Heidi. I think there are three important attributes to these elections that are very unique. Uh, number one, um, I think it's been far more efficient compared to previous years. Um, we only had a handful of of devices that were not able to rec recognize voters. But for the most part, uh, the electronic devices were uh, operating very well. Uh, number two, as you said earlier on, the voter turnout was uh, significantly lower than 2017 and 2013. And number three, um, it's uh, very, it's sort of becoming an issue-based elections as opposed to previous years. The matters economy has really captured uh, the minds and the hearts of many voters and the politicians have tried to turn this into an issue-based um, elections. Uh, David, from the people VOA has spoken to in the country, many have praised the process, but Kenyan elections are not obviously just watched um, in, across Africa, but also around the world. What is your assessment of how this election has gone so far? Well, I can speak from my own personal um, experience. So I went to my voting center, and it was very easy. I typed my name into the um, IEBC, which is the Electoral Commission app, and I was able to find the location for my voting center and also what line I was going to follow in order to cast my vote. I was given six ballots, all color-coded, so that went really well. Um, I think in terms of some of the challenges that we've experienced, um, one of the big ones, obviously, is the diaspora voting, which would be for Kenyans abroad in the U.S., in South Africa, in Rwanda, and outside Kenya. They can only vote for president, in, and so they cannot vote for the other five uh, electoral uh, positions. I think also in terms of the tabulation of results, ID, we, we have um, a lot of angst right now because a lot of these processes are being done manually. Obviously, the commission wants to make sure that the results are credible. But because there's a, there's, a, there's a trust deficit every time we have these elections, 
there's a lot of the manual counting, which really makes the process very slow. And that's actually what's going on right now. So a lot of these elements in terms of um, lack of the application or extensive application of technology and that trust deficit is actually leading to some of this anxiety. So the Electoral Commission has seven days to release the results. Um, but obviously, you can imagine the economic cost in terms of financial markets, in terms of uh, even students going back to school, and also generally in terms of the angst for the country. But overall, I would say this election has been a lot better run than some of the, the ones I've seen in the past in 2017, 2013, and even 2007. Um, Ken, we, we've seen post-election violence, of course, in, in previous cycles. Um, are there any forces at play this time and here that could lead potentially to violence again? Well, it doesn't appear so. Uh, it might be too early, but uh, it doesn't appear so. Um, I think uh, fear of things like the ICC after the 2007 elections, there were those ICC investigations, and I think those have made the leaders to be a bit more, uh, a bit a, a bit cautious in terms of uh, conducting violence. Uh, but also there is that economic part where there is just that fatigue. Uh, people are being worn down by an economy that's not creating jobs. So there's a level of fatigue that might not even want, that people just want to get back to business and back to making money uh, to put food on the table. David, earlier you spoke about this trust deficit, and both candidates have said that they will accept the result of the election. You may have heard me ask um, our correspondent Vincent McCory this question earlier. But what about their supporters? Uh, do they support that idea? Vincent said, you know, sometimes uh, leaders listen to their supporters. Um, but the supporters listen to their leaders, but sometimes the leaders listen to the supporters. Um, what do you see playing out here? Well, I, I see um, there's obviously always a, a proclivity and a chance for, for violence. But I think the trust deficit that we spoke to is very much tied to the transactional nature of Kenyan politics. So on one hand, the voters go to a lot of these rallies for cash handouts. And in return, the politicians expect at least a small minority who win office, they expect to get uh, into office and recoup, um, you know, recoup what they've spent on elections. And that has a very close connection to a lot of the corruption scandals we have, because a lot of our politicians don't spend their own money, you know, in these elections. So there's this transactional nature of Kenyan politics, which really creates a problem in terms of of, of the trust deficit, not only between those who are running for office, but also the, the, the general population. And I think this is one of the elements that speak to the lower voter turnout. 2017, we had over 80% uh, voter turnout. 2013, we had over 85% turnout. But in this context, in 2022, the voter turnout has gone down by about 20% to six, um, from 80% to, in 2017 to 60% this election cycle. And I think part of that is the voter fatigue because Voters feel that these politicians constantly promise them heaven and, and don't deliver, you know, uh, bread in a handbasket. So there's just not that enthusiasm to go out there and vote. And lastly, I think part of the other element with the lower voter turnout is this other element of um, the context of the election. Um, the, the stakes, uh, you know, people are a lot more concerned with the economic a deterioration in terms of their incomes and um, the, the, the tension that there was in 2013 and 2017 is not there. But definitely this question of the trust deficit is a continuing uh, ailment of Kenyan politics and it's very rooted in the transactional nature of how Kenyan uh, politics is run between those running for office who hand out money for votes but also when they get to win office they tend to want to plunder the state resources to recoup what they've spent on elections. Uh, and Ken, to David's point, I want to look 
quickly at some of the issues that the front runners um, campaigned on. Raila Odinga says he wants to root out corruption, tackle inflation, the high cost of living. William Ruto, he painted himself as the hustler with this rags to riches story. And he's touting a sort of bottom up economic model. But one can't ignore the fact that these two men are really wealthy and powerful. They are part of the elite. And as of late, um, both are now part of the establishment. Who, in your view, did better in terms of painting themselves as the best candidate to represent the poor, you know, the everyday man? And how on earth did they even manage that to any extent in the first place? Well, I think, um, to be honest, I think it was the candidature of William Ruto that really uh, made these elections about the economy. Um, he came up and his team came up with the bottoms up logo and really has been pushing that agenda for the last two years. So to give him credit, he was able to turn this into an issue-based elections. Um, that said, uh, the proposals that he has put in place, uh, he talks about a hustler's fund, still not very clear. Uh, it operates, I was able to ask him at a town hall to elaborate what, uh, how the hustler fund would be structured and I didn't quite get a very clear answer. Um, Raila Odinga has been there for many years, for 30 years, more than 30 years. Um, he's also running on an anti-corruption campaign. He's been able to argue that the reason Kenya's economy has not been doing well has been because of corruption, and he'll be able to fight corruption. Um, again, there aren't very many clear details on how he plans to do that. He's been quoting what the president says, that Kenya loses about um, $20 million every day to corruption. Uh, but he's not very clear on uh, where he'll be able to uh, plug in those numbers to be able to uh, create the numbers he needs to be able to support the families with a $60 promise that he's promising to uh, low-income families. So lack of clarity on both sides, um, heavy messaging, but lack of clarity on both sides. Uh, David, and then there's the amount of money the candidates spent on themselves. We just saw a story about the amount of money going into campaigning. Um, we see this in the United States as well, where elections are also, of course, quite the spectacle and expensive one at that. Um, and then, as we spoke about earlier, there was this relatively low turnout. Uh, why all the pomp and fanfare? And does it pay off at the end of the day, not just in terms of enthusiasm, but where it really matters, and that is turnout at the ballot box? Was this money well spent? So I think there's two, two parts to that question. One, obviously, the pomp and ceremony uh, very much speaks to the, the nature of Kenyan politics, which is very much drawn on personality. So you have to have this pomp and fun fair to actually show that you have the gravitas to run for, for, pre, for the president. And that's part of the pomp and fun fair, uh, to be a credible candidate, to show the, you know, the common citizen that you have what it takes to be president. But I think, in, to, to the second part of your question, is it, is it helpful? I think for the, the small minority of politicians that end up winning, yes, they can uh, then advance and, 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 and access the state gravy train, so to speak. But I think then that plays into the, adds to the transactional nature of Kenyan politics, where, for example, we have a debt-to-GDP ratio that's tripled since the Kibaki administration till today, right, to, to, from 20% to over 60%. And when a lot of these candidates are making these promises of, stipends for the poor, of uh, investment in infrastructure, there's really no specifics of where this money will come from. So I think it then leads to the wider challenge of voter apathy, because people have heard this on and on and on, and it just keeps being the same old cycle. Um, you saw in some of your clips, a lot of the candidates were moving around in helicopters. And that really tells you that the road infrastructure is not that great. So even to move from fairly short distances, they have to hire helicopters. And then when the election cycle is over, those roads are not really fixed. So it's this endless situation that I then think leads to voter apathy and this continued trend of this um, 
trust deficit between the people who actually vote and the politicians that run for office. Uh, David and Ken, I want to ask you this question, both of you. We do not have a lot of time, so I want to get both of your answers. Uh, we'll start with you, Ken. What are the main domestic challenges you would say the incoming president will have to focus on immediately? Well, I think the most important thing has to create an economy that creates jobs. Uh, we have far too many young people living in universities, can't get jobs. The private sector has been crowded out and the public debt is ballooning, and that's what's crowding out the private sector. So to solve those twin issues of the public debt and unemployment, and as well as cost of living. Uh, David, what, what is your take? Yeah, I, I think I'd, uh, I'd echo what, what Ken has, has mentioned, but I'd also add in terms of foreign policy, uh, you know, we have our troops in Somalia, that's not been addressed in terms of the long-term um, strategic uh, narrative around that. We're sending troops to the DRC. You know, that's a very challenging political quagmire. But I think locally, uh, issues of re reinvigorating the economy, uh, issues of youth unemployment, and broader issues of improving the electoral infrastructure so that in the next five years, this electoral cycle is actually improved. Uh, well, David Monda, um, thank you so much. And same to you, Ken Gashingo. We're going to have to leave it there. David Monda is a professor of political science at City University of New York. And Ken Gashinga is a chief economist with Mentoria Economics, They're both in Nairobi. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time and for that analysis. Well, still ahead here on Straight Talk Africa. America will not dictate Africa's choices. So says U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. He's on a three-nation trip to Africa, making the case for democracy and selling the new U.S. strategy for sub-Saharan Africa. Stay with us. We'll break it all down for you. That's coming up after the break. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Hmoudou, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. For the second time as the top U.S. diplomat, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is visiting Africa. He is set to give a major speech in South Africa laying out the Biden administration's strategy for sub-Saharan Africa. Joseph Saini of the United States Institute of Peace says he expects Blinken to say he has come to listen to African-led solutions to the continent's challenges. We are there to see what are, what are the existing solutions and how can we support. So we are not leading the way, which is very important because the minute you jump in to lead the way, you suck the oxygen in the room and then you kill creativity. creativity. Food insecurity, agribusiness, and opportunities for the region's large population of young people are likely to be high on the agenda. And recent fighting in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo has escalated tensions between the Rwandan and DRC governments. And the DRC has accused Rwanda of supporting the M23 armed group. As Nicole Wittersheim of Human Rights Watch tells VOA via Skype. Violence has increased, civilians are getting killed in the Eastern DRC. Um, we want to see uh, the U.S. government uh, get agreement by Rwanda and Uganda to stop supporting the M23 forces in the East that are fomenting violence. Um, so we hope that that's on the agenda, and we're glad that um, Secretary Blinken is going to go to Rwanda and DRC. DRC also has an important election coming up. Engaging with leaders in Kinshasa and Kigali is the right move, says Michael O'Hanlon of the Brookings Institution. I think if Blinken explains that America's support for each country is going to be partly contingent on their improvement of their democratic and human rights 
and anti-crime, anti-corruption efforts, then it's a perfectly reasonable thing for him to go and deliver those kind of messages. Blinken's visit comes on the heels of an Africa tour by Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who blamed the grain shortage and acute food insecurity on Western sanctions on Moscow rather than Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Russia is winning the public opinion battle with its disinformation campaign in Africa, Saini says. But it is important for the United States and the West to up their game in terms of informing Africans and African countries. I think to, to set the record straight. Saini says it will take more than one speech by Secretary Blinken to counter Russia's disinformation campaign. But recent visits by high-level U.S. diplomats are a good start. Cindy Sain, VOA News. Well, Cindy Sain there with that report on U.S. Secretary of State's visit, Anthony Blinken's visit to three African countries, where he also launched the U.S. strategy for Africa. He visited South Africa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Rwanda. And it was while in South Africa that Blinken launched the Biden administration's plan. Now, his trip comes, of course, as the U.S. vies with Russia and China for favor on the African continent. As Blinken draws a distinction between Washington and Moscow's aims and investments in the region, and some are seeing echoes of the Cold War here. Let's take a closer look now at uh, Blinken's Africa visit. I have with me Elizabeth Sideropoulos. She is the chief executive of the South African Institute of International Affairs. She joins us from Johannesburg and also with us from Cambridge, Massachusetts, is Milan Fayulu. He is an entrepreneur and analyst with a focus on the DRC. Milan and Elizabeth, thank you so very much for joining me. Elizabeth, I'm going to start with you. During his trip, and as we saw in that story there before, Anthony Blinken said the world should not dictate to Africa. He also said that Africa is not being made to choose, but that the U.S. is, of course, offering Africa a choice. Um, what do you make of, of his trip and what he has said and sort of the message that he has been trying to convey to these three African countries? Uh, good afternoon, Heidi, and it's good to be with you. I think the the message has been certainly one that will differ, differentiate uh, this current administration from the previous uh, American administration, uh, that of Trump, and, and also the statements and the strategy that was rolled out by John Bolton uh, when he was national security advisor. And it's also in the context, of course, of a, a position that many African states took on the vote on on Ukraine at the UN General Assembly that put them at odds uh, with the position of of the US and 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 of its and of its allies so his uh, certainly his trip here in South Africa was was intended really to uh, uh, to to come across as constructive uh, to be in listening mode uh, to also be in learning mode. It was interesting uh, to hear in his uh, in his speech at the University of Pretoria, where he rolled out the strategy, that he said, you know, it's not about the U.S. trying to come to Africa and tell it how to do democracy. It's it's not about us having all the answers, but you know, we recognise that we also can learn, and that and that, and that this is a, a, a two-way partnership. And so I think it was about really trying to convey to Africa, a that. They not the U.S. is not there to tell them what to do because that really in the last few months didn't go down well uh, uh, in the context of Ukraine, where a lot of European countries were putting a lot of pressure on South Africa and other African countries to vote in a particular way. Um, and it's also and it also focused a lot on what is really critical to South Africa and the rest of the continent, which is the economics, the developmental dimensions of of, of a partnership, health, climate, uh, economic growth, and, and, and so on. Uh, and all of this, of course, formed part of this U.S. strategy towards Africa. I want to read some of the key points here. Um, it's to foster openness and open societies, deliver democratic and security dividends, fight COVID-19 and advance uh, the recovery, pandemic recovery and economic opportunity, climate change adapt adaptation and a just energy transition. Elizabeth, how implementable is this U.S. strategy? And if you look at the, the amount 
of, of money that is that accompanies the strategy. Uh, how practical and implementable is it in your view? So some of some elements of the strategy are not new. Uh, some elements uh, are, are really building on on existing uh, projects and 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 initiatives. Um, the issue of money is clearly something that uh, still needs some uh, additional work, some more detail. Uh, there were millions and billions. Uh... Sorry, can you hear me? I hear you very well. Yes, please continue. Uh, um, uh, so uh, the money, for example, the commitments around uh, infrastructure investment, uh, the announcement that had been made at the G7 uh, a meeting where uh, the U.S. committed to uh, 200 uh, million uh, uh, U.S. dollars in, 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 in rolling out what is seen as the, uh, as the competition, so to speak, as the alternative to the Belt and Road, all of those are uh, about blended finance. So it's unclear how much the U.S. government is putting into the pot uh, in order to leverage private sector finance. The same goes with uh, uh, initiatives around climate finance and so on. Of course, the United States committed at Glasgow last year uh, to provide South Africa as part of a, a package with the European Commission and with other European countries an amount of $8 billion dollars um, uh, over over a number of years for South Africa's transition to uh, a just energy transition. The devil in that commitment, which was extremely well received and has been seen as a potential template for other developing countries to wean them off uh, high fossil uh, fuel dependence, is really it's in the detail of how that finance is going to be rolled out, what the... Uh, what the obligations are going to be of the recipient country, how is, you know, what is the rates of interest, the degree of concessionality and all of that. And so while the, the speech, I think, highlighted all of the important messaging uh, that, you know, African countries would be receptive to, it is how that is rolled out and the speed with which some of these things are rolled out, which is important. The same can be said, for example, around vaccine equity issues which were discussed and where the Americans, unlike the Europeans, have been quite supportive for some time of South Africa's proposal at the WTO together with India on the trips, temporary trips waiver uh, around vaccine manufacturers. And of course, the U.S. is already supporting some of the vaccine manufacturing hubs, both in South Africa and in, and in Senegal. Uh, Milan, I want to bring you in here. Do African leaders, whether it's all of them or some of them today, still see themselves as being dictated to by the United States, by Russia, by China? Look, I think that uh, the people who have that perception are people who have troubles with their own records. I think that uh, we need to focus on uh, democracy. And I think that uh, to the extent that you are respecting democracy and you're comfortable in your track record, there's no need uh, to be fearful of any form of uh, dictate, right? So I think that you're seeing a lot of uh, leaders across the continent sort of like hiding behind that concept of we're being dictating things to hide uh, their own abysmal record. Uh, Elizabeth, how much distance is there between how leaders might feel about the United States? Um, I'm referring here to Anthony Blinken's visit and how, how that went down in South Africa and how, how leaders feel versus how ordinary people feel and perceive the United States. So, you know, it's always a little difficult uh, in the absence of sort of wild, wild scale uh, uh, polls on this. But, um, you know, polls in, 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 in the past, certainly in South Africa, which have asked people whether they, you know, which country would they like to study in or which country they would like to, to live in um, and so on, actually have rated the, the U.S. very extremely highly. Um, it's important to note that I think there is a, you know, there, there are strong links people-to-people -people links between the U.S. and, and certainly South Africa because also of, of the struggle uh, against apartheid, but also with the rest of the continent, uh, sort of a lot of student exchanges, a lot of cultural exchanges, um, so, so strong links. And, and, and so that's important. And, and certainly the soft power of, of, of the United States um, uh, is, is, is one that I think many African citizens are receptive to. Also, I think it's important that, you know, if you ask civil society in Africa, support 
for democratic uh, processes, for democratic movements, uh, social movements and so on, which are about holding governments accountable. And this goes back to the point that was just raised now about, you know, are, are, are governments democratic? Are they doing what they should be doing? Is something that many uh, African civil society organizations see, this, uh, see the U.S. as being a strong proponent of and indeed helping them. Uh, to help uh, to to keep their governments accountable. So it's 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 not a it's not a black and white perspective and perception of the U.S. Even I would argue among governments. Uh, you know, I think governments have may have issues with certain elements of of the way in which the U.S. behaves. Most notably, in, if you look at the case of South Africa, on on the way in which the U.S. itself takes unilateral action when it uh, it feels its interests are threatened. But that doesn't undermine the, the other elements of the relationship, certainly economic, trade, soft power, cultural, uh, uh, educational, science and technology exchanges, which both citizens and I think uh, many governments also regard as extremely valuable. Milan, I'm going to come to you next as we continue our discussion right after this break. to start or change careers but find reasons why they can't or shouldn't. Despite varying obstacles, there are many success stories. On this week's episode of Our Voices, we'll examine some of the challenges and success that African women experience on the continent and in the diaspora on their journey to entrepreneurship. Join the conversation each week right here on Our Voices. States will not dictate Africa's choices, neither should anyone else. The right to make these choices belongs to Africans and Africans alone. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking in South Africa on his tour of the region. Um, Milan, I want to bring you in here. Um, the DRC was, of course, the second stop of the Secretary of State's um, trip. What is his relationship like? What is Washington's relationship like with Kinshasa? Um, is there a difference between how ordinary people perceive the United States versus um, the leadership? We seem to be having some audio issues there with um, Milan. Um, I'm going to go back to you, Elizabeth. Um, part of Blinken's tour is, of course, to promote democracy. But what, in your view, um, are, there, are there any forces at play that are anti-democratic that need addressing here on the, on the African continent? Look, we, I mean, you know, we know that in Africa we have problems uh, with uh, good governance, with accountability, uh, and therefore with the, the broader uh, sort of framework of, of, of democracy. But it's not uh, that we are unique on this planet. Uh, it was interesting that Secretary Blinken highlighted that, that democracy has been on the back foot for some time now, particularly, I think, it became particularly apparent since the global financial crisis of 2008. And it's been a case both in the industrialized world as, as, world as well as in, in, in the developing world. In Africa specifically, of course, more recently, we've had a, a spate of coups, which we had thought, particularly in West Africa, which we had thought we had put behind us uh, uh, some years ago. And there's certainly a growing concern on the continent as much as I think um, among uh, our partners uh, abroad about the slide away and the recognition that unless our political systems in Africa are able to deliver for the ordinary person. So the, the conversation that you were having just now around Kenya and what, what is driving, what are the Kenyans' key concerns in their election uh, 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 today 
it, it is about uh, ensuring there are jobs, ensuring people's living standards uh, are, are of a certain level that allows them to live in dignity. There is health, there is education, there is a responsive government, there is a responsive political elite. And I think one of the big challenges of Africa, notwithstanding the fact that I think we have made great strides over the last 30 years in terms of a more, account, more accountable systems of government is exactly that. And I, I think what was interesting was Naledi Pandu, our, our foreign minister's uh, comment uh, at, the, at the press conference with uh, Tony Blinken, where she says, you know, we have some of our own homegrown solutions, uh, which we obviously need to use more effectively. And, and, and she mentioned specifically the African peer review mechanism, which is about states being reviewed on their governance across across four key pillars uh, and, and then actually uh, the idea is really for them to work on improving their accountability, their good governance. Um, but those are, those are issues, of course, that, that uh, some states in Africa have to grapple more than, with, than others. But this is a general problem which I think all of us committed to democracy uh, need to really be concerned about. We need to show that democracy brings, uh, provides the dividends. The socioeconomic dividends. Uh, Milan, I hope we've resolved the audio issues here. Can, I want to go back to our previous question um, that I had put to you. What is the relationship like between Kinshasa and Washington? Because there's lots of complaints that while the U.S. Uh, seeks to build better relations with Africa, is Washington still the place where decisions are made when it comes to Africa? Can you give us some insight into how you see that? Well, I think that the, the fundamental problem in the relationship between the DRC and the United States is the fact that uh, the current Congolese government is at odds with everything Washington stands for, at least on paper, right? Like the U.S. new policy towards Africa is focused, and I quote, on diplomacy and development. And uh, it further adds that there's going to be a sharp focus on governance. Well, the 2018 elections in the DRC brought in power a regime that's illegitimate. So Anthony Blinken is meeting with someone that does not have a clear mandate from the Congolese people and who is ruling against um, all, um, you know, like credible um, sort of like, you know, like accountable processes. And that's why you're seeing today uh, the government is not accountable. Human rights are being abused. And so you're sort of like on this weird footing where you have, uh, on the one hand, an American um, uh, secretary of state who's promoting a democratic agenda but whose you know, like, uh, government he's meeting with does not represent anything the U.S. stands for. So what type of messaging uh, can Blinken has? He's working um, a very uh, fine line over there. So I think uh, you're starting from like a wrong footing. And I think it's extremely difficult uh, for uh, Mr. Chisekedi uh, to say anything that's representative of the Congolese people in general and the youth in particular. Uh, but clearly, the United States, Milan, does see um, some value here in this relationship, in building a partnership. It chose the Democratic Republic of Congo um, out of these three nations. The DRC is one of them. The United States must see something there and, and someone there that they think they can work with and that they want to work with. I think that anything that you're trying to build needs to involve the people, right? And I think that one of the problems of U.S. diplomacy uh, on the continent over the last few years, it has, it has focused on short-term solutions, and uh, it's sort of like kicking the real problems down the road. And we're seeing that we have no stability nor economic prosperity. So I think that Mr. Blinken needs to make very tough decisions. He needs to hold truth to American values and tell the truth which is the United States will not accept um, uh, elections that are not fair and transparent. The United States will not compromise on its values. And this is how you build strong relationship because relationships are not between um, people. They're not between, I mean, like, they're not between leaders, they're between people. And I think that, you know, Congolese have 80% of their population under 30 at this point. We want to see that the United States is serious about democracy, and that will help the U.S. in its relationship with Congo uh, because it will be perceived as a credible partner. So to conclude, I'll say that the U.S. is its own worst enemy on the continent. Uh, Elizabeth, both the United States and China have invested heavily in, in infrastructure and other areas in a wide um, array of African countries. But I want to ask about Russia. How widespread are Russia's interests on the continent? Are they interested 
in the entire continent in as many countries as the United States or, or China, for example, might be interested in? Or uh, do they want to get closer with just a few strategic countries? So the first point to make about, about Russia is that it doesn't have the kinds of resources that China has, or indeed that the U.S. The US has. Uh, if, we, if we talk specifically about the United States, um, you know, one of its, its big advantages, particularly in, in certain countries like South Africa, is of course it's, it's very vibrant and active private sector and business. It's about investment and, and, and so on. And you see uh, China also uh, making a number of, of, of investments uh, in manufacturing, uh, some in high tech, etc., in, in parts of the continent. But both of these countries have deeper pockets than Russia has. Um, Russia sort of disconnected from the continent after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after the fall of the, the end of the Soviet Union in, in 1991. It focused its energies on Europe. And it, it has only very gradually begun to reconnect and rebuild its old, also historical relations. The first trip by Putin was in 2006. And then it's been building up very, very, very incrementally. Its footprint is nothing like, um, certainly from an economic perspective, is nothing like China's or, or the U.S.'s. It, it certainly is, has a diplomatic presence in, in, in many African countries. I forget now how many uh, missions it has on the continent. But it has, particularly over the last few years, also using the first Russia-Africa summit in October 2019 as, as the platform. It's really uh, built up its diplomatic engagement, more frequent visits to the, to, to the continent, but also in terms of where it's really deploying resources, it's where it, it, it can be, it can, make a, it can make a quick win, or where it sees a potential political advantage, uh, like in Mali, sort of uh, with the discontent around the French deployment in Mali against the insurgents, where it's now become, the, you know, the current uh, uh, coup leaders are, are very pro-Russian, to be, become involved in the Central African Republic. And its focus really is arms sales, which has been a historical area, nuclear energy, so it's signed a number of, of agreements, memoranda of understanding with uh, a number of countries on the continent around certainly setting up a reactor, if not nuclear energy, like the discussion we had here in South Africa some years ago. Um, there's obviously also some mining interests. Um, but its footprint is really small. It's not a big trading mm. partner. China is by far the biggest partner of, of, of Africa from a trade perspective. And certainly uh, it's, it's not a big investor either. Uh, uh, Milan, just very briefly, we don't have a lot of time. Um, the DRC was the one country visited by both Anthony Blinken and, of course, Sergei Lavrov. Um, what does Russia's interests and investments look like in the DRC? What are they putting in and what are they getting out? So I think Sergei Lavrov visited uh, the Republic of Congo, not the DRC, right? So right now you have um, very much uh, a relationship with the United States. Uh, Russia is not very present in the Congo. But I think what's uh, very important to focus on is as the country descends um, in a state of insecurity, particularly in the eastern region, you're facing a situation where you may have certain actors trying to fill in the void. And this is where, again, I go back to a sharp focus on governments. I think Anthony Blinken needs to understand that this void gets filled up by bad actors when the United States uh, doesn't hold true to its values. So again, you need uh, democracy, you need uh, an accountable government, and that comes with very incredible elections. And Milan Fayalu and Elizabeth Sideropoulos, thank you so much for your time. We're going to have to end it there. I appreciate your perspectives. And that is our show this week. Thank you to Vincent Bakuri in Nairobi, to all my guests and our affiliates. Thank you to you for joining me, and thank you for always watching.